previously, we spent uh, six lectures to explain Dirac theory and the quant quantize it. And I realized, hey, now we know two kinds of particles we should make them interact and study the Yukawa theory. So previously, what we have seen is at the end of the day, through lecture and tutorial, we realize, OK, these Feynman rules are not mysterious. It's not just you know Feynman pat on his head, and then there's a light bulb come, and he write down these rules. Actually, Feynman is very famous for doing these things. Apparently, he has a cabinet, and like, it's just full of scratch paper. But he never tell anybody. He just like, oh, this is totally intuition. So, anyway, now we have rules. It's like uh, the Lego game. You have different parts and just stick together. They become Feynman rules. You can just rewrite a matrix element and you can evaluate. And you can calculate the things like cross section, which is very exciting because they are observable. Okay, so I'm not planning to write down the Feynman rules on board because we're going to write down them on board tomorrow so in the not so distant future, but 24 hours from today, you will see all the rules on board. So I'm just going to emphasize a few things. I guess this is something we have seen is a fermion going they fermion, they scatter. This is the example we've seen in the class. And uh, after playing with the vertex and how many lines are coming out and such fun things you've done a lot with them. And then you realize these are the two diagrams I can draw. And then what we spend a lot of time says, oh, oh, there is a minus sign between them. And since this thing together will be squared, there is something called an interference. And the minus sign and the plus sign actually will be observable, will impact the correctness of our prediction. So an important minus sign here, which this one is intuitively explained by, hey, you have two fermions and they got a swept. Of course you get a minus and that's just Fermi Dirac. And then what else we have learned is that I'll try my best to phrase as everybody else. But I don't know why. Apparently I'm not very good at it. So let's just label them one, two, three, four. And what else do I need? OK, so let's see. One, always have P1, K1, S1. And two will have K2, S2, such and such. And now we will say, OK. I understand where the rules come from. It would be good to know if I have given some rules how to actually do the calculation, how to write down a matrix element for a Feynman diagram. So what do we do is follow the fermion lines in the opposite direction of where the arrow goes. So if the arrow goes this way, We'll follow the fermion lines this way. And our rule says the outgoing fermion will have a U bar. But this is not something like you have to really memorize, because if you don't start with a U bar, you're probably not going to be end up with something a scalar, which we, our matrix element is a scalar, right? So if I follow this line, I get a U bar and a U. So let me 
actually try to restore the gloriness of the all kinds of labels. That says, I follow the line, I see a one. So these guys get dotted together. Is for the dot notation is always for the Lorentz. So that means in terms of a spinner indices, they are contracted. If you see any such thing in some reference, such that the, on, the dot is the only thing that's left, then that means in spinner indexes, they are contracted. They does really not have anything to do with the labels, the, the, the spin label, the polarization. Okay, so that's what I do. I grab a fermion line and go in the opposite direction of the line. And then I'm done. And then I look at the other line. So since I already did it once, this time I'll do a little faster. And then write down this term. So it's exactly the same term. I switched the three for four to one for two. And now the only thing left is I should have a bosonic propagator. Okay, a lot of time I'll just not write it because I'm lazy. Also, most of the time when you calculate the matrix element, it doesn't matter. And the bosonic propagator shouldn't be very complicated because we know, sorry, this one should not have the arrow because I do care about a four momentum. It's just U itself is a function of a three momentum. So then there's K1 mu come in, K3 mu come out, and then you can calculate what is flowing on the scalar line. It's called the momentum conservation at each vertex, which you have all seen from the scalar theory. This has not changed. Momentum, for momentum is still conserved at each vertex. And then, of course, at the very end, I should write to indicate that this is the second order, that there are two vertexes. Yeah? We will face a little bit of complication in QED about this vertex. And we'll see tomorrow. And uh, what else I want to see? OK. What I want to write it explicitly today is this spin label. Several of you guys have already asked. These spin labels are actually important. Because we, what we have been doing, remember at the very beginning when we tried to calculate this amplitude, which is given by two fermions scattering to two fermions. There is literally two one particle state scattered to two one particle state. So this particle carry this spin label. We know it or not, doesn't matter, but they do carry a spin label. <laughs> if you grab a one particle, it has a spin pointing somewhere. So what we will do tomorrow, when we calculate the matrix element, is that we'll make the following claim, which is very true, is that uh, experimentally, it's very, very hard to prepare a jet, a beam of particles that has the same lineup of the spin. So that's not what experimentalists do anyway. Maybe some of them can do it, but that's not what they do in the colliders. On the other hand, mirroring what comes out is also very challenging. What comes out is already very challenging. And if you want to know what's the spin, they don't do it. They just 
dome. So what we end up doing is something called average initial. It's like we have a whole beam of things. So probably half, half. Well, the beam has lots, lots, lots of particles. So when it's that large, it, it's OK. And then we'll sum the final. We'll find out. So if we don't sum it, we'll find out these two particles will become two particles having this particular kind of spin. What's the cross section? But normally, you don't care about that. You are like, as long as you go to two electrons, I care. You don't, you don't distinguish that clear. So eventually, OK, tomorrow. Well, the reason I'm not doing it today is because, after all, this is not. We are doing a toy model of Yukawa. And um, it's kind of not inspiring to calculate, carry a calculation all the way. But because of the toy model, there is actually no experiment you can compare. So, and then the other diagram you can write down in the similar fashion. So, what else I want to see? Well, these guys dot together because they meet at a vertex. You are really literally following, off, following, following along the fermion line to figure out what contracted with which. So, as I mentioned, I could just take this and calculate what I can get, but, uh, well, it's kind of not very useful because I can't compare with anything. So, let's not do it. Which means we're going to start a new chapter. So, it's a good time for you to ask questions. Any question regarding the fermionic part. And you saw all the interview questions. That's regarding these six lectures. So anybody has any question before we move on, away from a fermion? Not very far, just for this one lecture. No? Uh-huh. Is the general rule for determining the minus sign between these diagrams? Oh, right. So what I ask you guys to do is a electron scattering with a no a, a fermion with a anti-fermion. And then we figure out that you, there is a minus sign between them. It's not uh, the most uh, enlightening rule, but uh, you know, after you perform a few weak contraction and perform a few more in the loop level, you would, uh, might say, OK, this rule will just work. OK, so what do we do is to label the legs. And then now we want it to make one diagram looks like the other. And this is not going to happen if I don't, if I only do some swapping, it's not going to happen. Because this one clearly tell me, OK, I'm silly. The time goes up. OK, this one clearly tells me that one and two didn't meet at the vertex. This one says it did. So no matter what I do, they're not going to look alike. So what we need to do is, well, we can rotate it. It still wouldn't uh, be the same, but uh, at least uh, there is a chance. So we're going to rotate it. I don't know which way is better to rotate. And now, what we need to figure out is to swap these labels 
okay, I probably didn't pick the best rotation because now none of them agree with each other. <sighs> Maybe the other way? No, never mind. I'm just labeling them in a weird way that they're not going to agree. Okay, but now I can swap some labels. So I'll do like one, three, two, four. So that's one swap. And uh, but the two wants to be here, so one, two, three, four. But the three and the four also needs to be swapped, so you got the three steps. Since you take three steps, as you guys are now very familiar with swapping things, <laughs> whenever you swap things, you get a minus sign. If you three swap three times, you get a minus. Okay, so. Another probably related questions that the people have asked about is about this Mandelstrom variables that people use very often. It's very useful that I haven't mentioned. In other words, it's called the UST channels. The idea of this is very simple. We have four legs, and there are only three ways to pair two of them together. You can pair one, two, one, three, one, four. That's it. So Mandelstrom decided to name them to be UST. I can only remember one, two is U, because three, four, I don't know. I know how, it's hard to remember. Remember which is S, which is T. You just have to be consistent with yourself. One, two is S, I think. Right, one, two is S. And the U and the T is the one I, I can't remember. One, three is U. Ah. Oh, oh, sorry, one, three is T and one, four is... Yeah, but he might not label the three, four the same way I label. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One, two is guaranteed that we will agree, <laughs> right? So the, the idea, that's, that's the, basically the idea. The inspiration is writing this... All the time is really a waste of chalk and time. So, and if it's a channel, it's always like this. Why don't we name it something else? That's really the same thing. And it's because it's momentum square, so it's definitely invariant. So it's nice. And it has units of energy square. So that's all it is. But uh, it's helpful when you draw a Feynman diagram because at a tree level, basically, it's telling you you have three maximum poss possibility unless you have some like symmetry like that. But uh, you have three possibility. And as you see, in this case, I didn't draw the case one meter two because we were smashing two fermions together. That's not going to work because my scalar doesn't carry charge. So one of some, for scalar, you probably, all, for, for lambda phi 4, you probably always have the three channels. But once there is something called a charge, then some of it the same in this case. In the two cases have been shown on board, one of the diagram is just disappeared because that channel, the charge cannot be conserved. So it's a really useful way, but uh, unless you're really into the field of uh, calculate things in terms of STU, th that the only thing you need to remember is that there are three channels. Whenever anybody like me <laughs> and Dan will ask you to draw a Feynman diagram, you check your three channels. And if you draw the three channels, well, it, it only works for the two to two. But the only thing really we ask you is like two to two, two point function, three point. If we ask you five point function, you'll be like, oh, I passed. They are really bored. <laughs> so, and a four point, in principle, four point function is harder. So, it's a great way to keep in mind when you draw a Feynman diagram of a two to two scatter. So I'm not going to write down because I can't remember the formula. I can remember the one, two. I think, I think actually, because 
I think it depends on your metric. There might be a minus sign. So <laughs> I'm really not sure. So this, but I can upload the tutorial to focus on the Mendelssohn variables and you can play with them. I think S plus T plus U equals something like 4M squared coming from four momentum conservation. They are all simple algebra. I trust you can do it. Okay. Other questions? Other questions? No? Are you really sure no other questions? Well, I guess today's homework is to submit a question. So if you suddenly have a question that uh, we wouldn't know, I will know. What did I do? <laughs> Can we guess what's next topic? <laughs> Question mark. Something with photons. Thought, uh... Will we talk about photons? Let there be light. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's see how could we spend only less than one lecture on photon. All right. I must have to talk very, very fast. Like six times fast. Well, actually, next lecture is also photons. So only three times as fast. Okay, Maxwell theory is and uh, quantizing the Maxwell theory. Photons. Well, before photon, let's write down the the thing that predicts photons. So the following will be a snapshot of what you have learned from the relativity and David's front end course. And you should have all seen, and I have seen the tutorial, and you have done a lot of work on them. But still, slow me down if I'm going too fast. Okay, I'm just writing down, it's just a review. We'll just directly jump to the Lagrangian because you have seen it. So this is the free Maxwell theories Lagrange. Yeah? Not a big surprise? No? Good. I think I also interviewed you guys on this. And this is the free Maxwell equation of motion. And I'd better define this thing. No surprise. And then, uh, what's the next thing? Oh, next thing we also mentioned in this course, we realized this theory has a thing called a gauge symmetry. That if you add a total divergence of a scalar function on it, uh, because this guy doesn't change, they each get a term, but they cancel. So it's a symmetry in some sense. It's not really a theory. It's not really a symmetry because we can't use it to find a conserved charge. It's just des describe the theory in a little redundant way. Because how many photons do we have? How many kinds of? Yeah, two. Okay, which means, you know, then the, there is the, but, but it, it's nice, look, it, it looks Lorentz. I don't even have to say, oh, look, how do I know this thing is Lorentz in, invariant? It, it just looks like Lorentz invariant. <laughs> look at this thing. <laughs> so it, we just try to do it completely in Lorentz invariant way and we, we, we will benefit a bit. We'll benefit in this way. But my point is because of their this gauge symmetry normally people pick a gauge 
Otherwise, this redundancy just stick there forever. I'm sure, I think in Aggie's course, you guys already picked a gauge, which is the <laughs> gauge really useful for quantum optics that to actually, you know, study with experiments. And there is a very good reason for non-relativistic things don't have to try so hard to respect to respect to rel the Lorentz inverse. But we are talking about the colliders. Well, at least I am. I'm sorry that um, you know if I come from a particle background, it's very hard for me to teach a course that doesn't talk about the colliders. Okay, so the point is. We're going to fix the gauge. Well, I guess the next thing we can always do is, well, let's just say what happens to this equation of motion if I plug the definition in. David used box, right? I think he used box. So we get something like this. And I think David also picked the same gauge is that uh, we like to see wave equations. So we'll pick the Lorentz gauge, which is, of course, Lorentz invariant, except is discovered by this Lorentz, whose name is one letter away from the other Lorentz. <laughs> but anyway, so this seems a convenient choice. Once you see this, you were like, oh, if this just disappeared. OK, so this sounds good. And why should we be very excited about that equation of motion? It's massless Klein Gordon. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I guess at this point, it would be a good point to try to solve for the mode expansion that we know we have to use to quantize. It. So the proposal will be. As usual, we're not very creative, is that it's going to be a plane wave. Normally, I would just propose, let me just move it. I don't even know. Normally, I'll just propose there is some coefficient that uh, this thing would work. But this actually doesn't work. Because we know it has this redundancy, it's not like four of them are independent. There's some constraint, such as this gauge condition, we oppose on it. So, which means I'm going to label them and sum them over. So, we are actually going to write down the general solution because. Each individual one can't be all independent because we a priori know that they are not. Yeah, that's why it's different from the way we solve the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation, we know we're going to find the independent solution, so we can just solve one by one. For this, we just have to solve it as a lump sum. Then we can make some, some good choices some simple choices, but at the beginning, we have to do it with a lump, lump sum. So the next step will be write down the gauge condition, which will bring the k down. I don't really particularly care about the minus i because it's going to be 0. So this is what I have. Yeah. This is called the transversality condition that you must have heard of. The, the photon is moving 
in a direction perpendicular to the polarizations. It's written in a funny way, but that's just all what it is. So now we can make some clever choice. As you probably know, we always have a reference momentum because it's a photon. Okay, that's right. Because it's a photon, I can't go to the rest of frame, get rid of three components, so I do the second best thing, which is get rid of two components. Yeah? This can't, this, this shouldn't be a surprise. And because of this, I can make choice as this first, the, The lambda go from zero to three, the spatial one guy just look like one. There's a one there. This guy just look like this. Certainly satisfied the dot product equals zero. Yeah? So now we can simplify this condition to be k times epsilon. Maybe I'll keep all the index around. So this thing, the zero component of the epsilon plus this thing, the third component should equal zero. Well, this certainly tells us it's great that I can also make the same choice. I can just do this and make this because there is a minus sign in my metric that will make that work. So isn't that nice? Our polarization vector just looks like a very normal base vectors, just like four of them. And then you can just claim, oh, we have covariance, covariance. You can just boost that momentum or rotate or whatever, do some, do some Lorentz transformation on that momentum, and I will figure out to how this polarization vectors. So that is the claim. And if you, but normally, what it does, so this is just a simple example, what we can do is that you just pick a reference momentum and you pick the absolutely simplest possible polarization vector. In general, without referring a... So now we have momentum k mu. A general k mu, what the people does, is to pick epsilon one dot k equals epsilon two dot k equals zero, and then the other the other one you can't really pick. That one just reinforced by the gauge condition. So as you can see, I dropped the mu nu index. They are contracted. And then, in general, what the people does is that there is some lambda labeling which photon it is. And then there's mu labeling. This index just inherits from the A mu. You are solving for a vector. Of course, your solution is a vector. The lambda is labeling which photon you have. I guess this is the cute thing that uh, for Lorentz gauge to have is that you can actually find your polarization to be very orthonormal in every way that you wished. These are just not orthonormal conditions. Bunch of like one minus one minus one minus one zero zero. They just normalize things. So that's what people do in general. 
and then we call them the good polarization vectors. And now we have the solution. We have polarization vector. And then, oh, we're good to go. Okay, so far, so that is all I want to say about the Maxwell theory. So now we're going to quantize it. Yeah, everybody's good to go. Keep in mind, they're just a bunch of Klein Gordon equations. Okay, so remember, oh, a very wise guy has a lot of risks. How do we quantize? Step one is pick a Lagrange. Step two, calculate the conjugate momentum and Hamiltonian. Step three, impose commutator relationship. And step four, normal order. Yeah? Third time is a charm. So you kind of be so surprised by this recipe. That's how we do things. All right. I don't think it's a terrible surprise that the Lagrange I chose to quantize is the one that I just talked about. Step one is done. Step two, calculate the conjugate momentum. So remember there are four fields. And no. there are four field. Each of them con come with a conjugate momentum. Could you use 20, okay, one minute to calculate what's pi zero, just zero, just the zero. Yeah. What's the result? Zero. Yeah. Do you see any problem with conjugate momentum being zero? Yeah, this, 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 you'll be like, oops. Hmm, this is not gonna work, isn't it? On one hand, I want this thing to be something like I delta with a bunch of other coefficients. On the other hand, no matter how hard we try, commutator relationship with a zero is always going to give us a zero. Zero is zero. It's very powerful. Yeah. What did I do wrong? So clearly I can't continue. I have a momentum equals zero. And, uh, so, so far, what do we have done? Let's, let's see what I will have done. Have done is we pick an Lagrange and we find the equation of motion and then we impose the gauge condition and then we get the equation of motion which is the box guy which we really like. This is what we really like. But this is definitely not. Okay, well, since we're stuck at a step two, we'll backtrack. Now we're back at a step one. So one thing, you know, people propose would be 
Since you are doing these things in two steps, could we find the Lagrangian such that it directly gives my equation of motion, which is this box guy, and just, you know, impose the gauge condition some, sometime later, just postpone this step. Well, a natural thought would be, it's called the Lagrangian multiplier. If I just add to this Lagrangian something, something I'm going to impose to zero anyway. It shouldn't change much, right? OK, so I'm not going to do this derivation. It's not a terribly complicated. It's in electronom. Doesn't take much step to show this indeed achieve what we want, which is you just do all the Lagrangian equation on this, you will directly get a box. And the gauge condition is sort of hidden there. And then there is another step I'm not going to show. Is that you know Lagrangian? Yeah, but uh, normally who the way says who cares about totally derivatives? If it has something partial mu of something, if we after we integrate it to get our action, it's going to become boundary terms. And you know, for the first time study, we don't care about boundary terms. So you can do further algebra, which you can also see in the lecture notes, to say that this Lagrangian can look like this. I think there is one. So this, I call it the, the, the cute Lagrangian. But it's really cute. Look, look how terribly beautiful it is. Why is it so beautiful? If I may, I could switch this a mu, write it in. Look, so just understand a mu. Forget about their photon, and the swap off them out with this. Thing. Yeah. We have seen Klein Gordon equation somewhere, and then now we even cooked a Klein Gordon action out of it. Isn't this nice? Oh, nice or not, this is a good time to stop. So I'll see you in five minutes. OK, so, so, so as, as we, were, we pointed before, we saw Klein Gordon equation of motion. We get excited. Then we saw Klein Gordon Lagrangian. We get even more excited. Ah. So this is the time we profit. We profit from all this massage. You can look at the lecture notes. It's not pretty. But uh, we profit with all this massage we do to the Lagrangian. We profit from spending so many lectures on scalar field. Now we are just going to profit. Of course, you know, you have to pay some price. But we will profit first. So the, the following things we're going to do is try to say how we can profit from this. First, let's see what happens to the momentum now. Is, well, we do the same thing. But this time, since look at how great this Lagrangian look, I'll just do them, all of them together. Well. It must be like this, right? With a minus sign. I just write the two indices down here and then brought it up. Because this Lagrangian looks so, there's only one term and it looks very symmetrical. So if I do the derivative, except that the half get canceled by the doing derivative of x squared, this would I have. And I can even write it even more familiar using the dot notation for time theory. Look, see, we even have the momentum looks like what we have before.
no wonder we think we'll profit. Okay, so since this is so promising, let's just go ahead and impose the commutator relationship since that's all the quantization thing about is about. So before there is some factors that you say I'm not a big fan of. And uh, there is some dirt. And there is an I. But now, well, the only way that to make Lorenz happy is to put something has mu nu there. Right? There's not much negotiation going on. That's what it is. So we can check. We can check for when it's spatial component. But the eta ij, uh, yes, the eta ij is important. And the dali dala dala. Okay. So this, according to the conjugal momentum, momentum calculation, it gives us a minus. And this is just minus one because I decide to pick spatial. Yeah? Um, should the, the two pi to the third and the two EP factor really be there? I mean, we don't. No, I'm silly. This will only be there in the next line. Sorry. Yeah, this, this, the, the point of picking this normalization is it doesn't show up here. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, it's the show up on the A's. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, now it looks much better. Why do I spend so much? Ah. Okay. Shall we pause and claim triumph? Look. Well, okay, let me take them to be the same because we know if it's different advantage. Ta da! No summing, also. It doesn't make any sense to sum them. All right, now we can claim, claim triumph because this minus sign cancels minus sign. You're like, wow. Even the commutator relationship looks like Klein Gordon. Well, except there is caveat. Because, see, why do I pick the spatial component? If I pick this component, then there is <coughs> minus sign on the left. <coughs> No minus sign on the right. I could have just moved this minus sign. Oh. We have been talking about the minus signs all the time. But the, before when we talk about the minus signs, we profit from them. And now it seems that we might suffer. We have a commutator relationship that has a minus sign there. Hmm, what does this even mean? Well, we don't know, right? So we just close, we decide, okay, maybe we'll have to pay price, but uh, let's keep going, so see how far we can profit. So we close our eyes and keep going. It says, now there is this, okay, so careful. There it is. 
many types of them. Okay, well, no. The next step, if I want to pass on this commutator relationship to some creation operator and annihilation operator, I had better write down the mode expansion. Otherwise, I don't even know what I'm doing. Okay, let me be smart. I mean, not the end of the, but I'm going to write down the separate one. Like I already split it into plus and minus. So this, it comes with that index for sure. And this, and for each of the solution, we associate a operator with it with a momentum dependence. And then we have this. I'll just write down the Heisenberger one because the process of be going from shredding picture to Heisenberg picture doesn't seem to do much. And let's sum over lambda. Yeah? Wait, no, I'm supposed to write down the plus, but I write down the minus. Okay, that's the minus. Now I'll write down the plus. Ah, where do I put the labels? Okay, I don't want it to look like a dagger. Yeah? Not a big surprise, the mode expansion look like that. It's the same for all three cases. You have, well actually, not for the scalar. Scalar doesn't have many components. It's similar to the spinner case. It has something in front, this polarization vector thingy. We called a U and a V before. And then it has creation annihilation operators. Yeah. Not a terrible surprise. Okay, since that's not a surprise, except that there are four of them, then it should probably, hopefully, not be a terrible surprise that if I pick this guy and then pick. This dagger at a different momentum, I suppose. And this should have gave you the thing with all these guys. Times eta. So this just whew, pass on to there. You did it for you know one of them. Now we have four of them, so there's not a big surprise that if the commutator relationship just can't get a pass through. Yeah. And that minus sign on the zero component is is it yeah. there somehow? On the eta in the eta. On the. Oh, see, that's a great, great question. No, actually, just it corrects my error. There should be a minus. Otherwise, the zero component is the good guy. But actually, what we discovered, the zero component is bad. Yeah, there is a minus sign there. So because previously, we know that uh, the zero component is the problem, and the spatial component are the very good normal klein gordon So yes, indeed, this problematic minus sign get a pass on to the zero component. So let's forget about the other component for now. And uh, okay, I'm just writing with the really small and tiny, you all know what that, this thing. It's the, supposed, the thing that's supposed to be there. Maybe I should define another name. 
Anyway, so, well, commutator relationship, creation operator, annihilation operator has a minus sign. What is that supposed to mean? Well, we have no idea. So, since we have no idea, so, well, I have no idea, so we can just continue. Charge on. We just push it as far as possible until we count. Hey, let's make a vacuum. Says that it's annihilated by everybody. Annihilated by the, all the annihilating things. Yeah, check. Good to go. And now let's make a momentum, a one particle state that is made by a creation operator. One particle state. So now we can look at, for example, this means lambda equals zero. So we make a state with momentum k and the lambda equals zero. And now we are curious about the norm of the state. It's a very valid question. You have a state, you want to normalize it. So let's say, oh, this board is so What do you think this is? Yeah, it's not ideal. You have to look at the. Yeah. Yeah, the minus sign now is now is really causing trouble. Before we can always just close our eyes as minus sign and we'll just carry the minus sign around me. There were so many minus signs in the fermion theory, they actually are important. And now we have trouble. What is a norm? <sighs> Supposed to me. Well, I, I, I really don't know. I think there are people studying negative norm states. In all the cases I have seen, we always say, oh, the theory has a problem with the query. How do we cure this? Well, we always, I don't know if you have seen this before, but physicists have this interesting thing to do is they, they just say, oh, you are, you are bad states. I'm just going to remove you. This is basically the solutions for norm, negative norm states. It's like, as, as, as we, how to do theory says, oh, you are very bad. I'll remove you from the physical states. Such that the thing I call a physical states which is, has impact on observables that doesn't have this kind of state, then, then we're fine, right? It's like the case in, it's like the case in Dirac theory, that, uh, that if you say that uh, Psi you can never observe, because I like you only care about bilinears. You know, per se, they might violate some causality since we'll never, we will never be able to observe them. Who cares? So, how do we remove them? 
The thing is, you can't just say, let's list all the negative states and then remove it. Okay. <laughs> it's a way to do it, but normally people do it in a systematic way. Also more convincing as, oh, we find a better state, I'll kick you out. <laughs> okay, the systematic way. Also, it makes sense. is to use something that to remember that we postpone for like three boards or maybe you know, the three boards, like the boards are right above it, is that we had a gauge condition, which is kind of forget about it, says, mm, I, I'm profiting, so I don't care about you. And now it's like the end of our wits. And we need to something to save us. Then we realize, hey, there is a gauge condition we never impose. I've heard of something like gauge condition can remove degree of freedom. So you'd better resurrect and help us. Okay. So then there is some problem. So, okay. Set this aside. Because we're always going to do this, so I might as well write it here. So basically, I will say, let's continue profit. <laughs> well, what, this is what we really want. I mean, what, why do we want to quantize this theory? We want a propagator out of it. We want to the, yeah? Um, didn't we miss an I uh, from the, there shouldn't be I's in the commutators over here. Yeah. yeah, there should be I. Huh. Oh, they look there. I think no, they should. There can't be eyes. These ones shouldn't. These ones don't have eyes. All right, thank you. No, no, no. That, that, that is a mod square, so it really shouldn't have eyes. Oh, those can't have eyes. Good. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Let's have morning also. I'm being silly. Okay, but, but look, we can still continue profit. Because remember, we, like, this is one of the most important things when you quantize a theory. After you have propagator, everything is just like a weak contraction into a propagator. So you, but now we know this guy is, is nothing but a Klein Gordon theory. I feel you guys. I'm better at writing this than me. And uh, there was an I here. And uh, to make it make sure that the time component is the one that is wrong, so there's a my. Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. It's just for Klein Gordon theory, so instead of doing whatever we have done by getting propagator, we'll just write it down. A lot of profit. Okay. So now we put these two things together. Can you see any problem if I impose this as an operator equation? I just force this to be true for any Beth yeah this one says okay let me give them some index this one says I want the four divergence of a mu to be zero this one says the propagator between a mu and the a nu is that thing. Something I can do a four derivative on x. Yeah? And there's the x dependence. And this is clearly not zero. So if we want to profit and use this as our propagator, there's no way we can impose our gauge condition. They just contradict. Inconsistent. So
So we make our retreat. Says, ah, oh, obviously, I can't use impose it. I can't impose it as a operator equation. Can I say that all physics state is annihilated by it? Then it's sort of imposing the condition. What's wrong with that? Well, we can see the really nicely splitting guys. Okay. Let's investigate it in the second option. Let's just check, sanity check. Start with vacuum. What happens if I impose this thing acting on vacuum? Wait, but I have an expression for it. Acting on vacuum. For the annihilation guys, certainly it will work. But this one says clearly says create a vacuum, create a particle in vacuum. This line clearly tells me to create a particle. So, okay, I guess this is the lesson is that uh, do not kick vacuum state out of the good guys. We want to keep the vacuum. Then we retreat again. It says, ah, but you did mention half of this works, right? Let's just impose a half of it and then impose the other half on the other side. Well, if we do that, since it's always split in half and a half that way, we manage to, to impose this condition, which is good enough. We're only going to impose our gauge condition on the physical states. If you have better states, you have better states. So that is how we just claim if this condition is not satisfied, then you will probably have some problem. And then you are not my physics. And of course, this is the time to ask the question, what does this buy us? What does this buy us is that we use a specific mode expansion which is right above me, which is nice. So I'll calculate this because it was in post half and a half. So I'm just gonna calculate what this is. It's not a terribly complicated. The derivative only acting on X, which as you rule, it bring down the momentum. It also brings down some i's and minus sign, but it's going to be set to act on physical state to equal zero, so I don't care about those things. So this is equivalent to brings down some momentum. And, uh, and there is this guy. And there is our operators. And uh, the lambda is summed up. And this is acting on physics state is zero. Yeah, it's really not very complicated. We take that, says derivative bring down a momentum. Momentum contracted with epsilon just as before, and we get this. What does this buy me? Well, remember our condition that we have over there 
says that I'll always choose the transverse condition such that one and two are just zero. So let's forget about them and vary about this. And uh, that. Yeah. The middle two just disappeared. And then we have further the condition on epsilon zero and epsilon three says I can just say this is also, okay, let me write it. So this is also zero except it has a minus sign. But now they are just proportional things. I'll take it out and uh, the conclusion we arrive is that Okay, remember we have two extra things called the time component and the longitudinal component that you didn't say in the Coulomb gauge quantization. They sort of uh, has the effect that they are correlated. You can't, this, this immediately tells you you can't really having a time component photon lying around without uh, something to do with the longitudinal. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that state is any state, it's not the vacuum. In no, no, it's not, a, it's, it's in general because I was, I'm just trying to say what this gives me. Because we, after the exploration is that uh, I don't even know what the gauge condition is going to give me, but this is our best thing we can do. The best thing is to impose an operator. We say it's impossible. The second and the best is to impose on states. Still not possible. So we did the best thing after that, which is impose half. Yeah. So we're using this relationship between epsilon zero and epsilon three. Yeah. Didn't that come from imposing the gauge condition like? Yeah. Zero mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah. But I thought we were now relaxing that condition. Well, that's the classical. We're relaxing, relaxing the quantum. Okay. That's so, just the classical condition to solve the classical solution. So it's, it's say this is sort of like we do impose this condition twice. Then, so, so you were like, but uh, this is not very illuminating. But uh, like, look at this. What does this supposed to mean? It says, zero, the time guy and the longitudinal guy will annihilate the physics state simultaneously. And, but what does that mean? They'll have, how is that has to do with observables we care so much? Well, let's say something really simple first. The simple thing to say is, of course, to move one guy to the other side. <laughs> Yeah? I claim <laughs> this, this has so much physical meaning than before. Phi square it. If I square it, what happens in the middle It's understandable. It's just this is the same as three. So basically, the first conclusion we get the number ne neither of this now neither of this are very interesting, but they equal. So there is the zero component photons we don't want, and there are three the longitudinal component photon we don't want, but the, the number of them are equal. Okay, you are not convinced that this is very observable. <laughs> so now it's the time. Remember, uh, there is a recipe. I sneakily skipped a step. 
I'm supposed to calculate the Hamiltonian, but I didn't. But it's okay. I'm sure at this point you are happy to calculate the Hamiltonian. What it gives is something just like before, except with our little small modification. This that's a pair of creation reader. And then, of course, our very famous eta guys comes back. And, uh, of course, to make the time component not desirable, there is a minus. Yeah, it's the same deal. We profit, prof, were profiting so happily, and we forgot to calculate the Hamiltonian. But we still can profit. If it's just a four Klein-Gordon field, we know what the Hamiltonian looks like. It looks like the energy times the number operator. Yeah. So now let's investigate what happens Two. So one and two are fine. We know it for a lot of reasons. The, the, the problem one is out the zero and the three guys. This one gives you a minus sign. And this one minus and canceled from the metric. But I just said that their number is equal. So at least from one way that we showed that it's okay. We did indeed, this, this condition looks very obscure, but indeed it removed the, the Time like photon, a longitudinal photon, at least from looking at the energy, you would never be able to measure it. They always cancel. The only thing left is indeed, this result is very important, is that, hey, there are two photons that are good, and they contribute. Just like two Klein Gordon. So this thing is called the Gupta Bloyer condition. So this is one way that we can quantize the photon. Is to pretend the bad photons are around so we can profit. But afterwards we'll find some way to get them out. And you will see in QFT2 how to do it in a past integral language. And, but that's another day. Right. So tomorrow, we'll finally reach our end of writing down QED and drawing lots and lots of diagrams.